And let me, let me take all of your lame excuses and just address them right now. Is that fair? Because they're my same lame excuses too. Here are some lame excuses. Oh, you know, but we're just like, we're just so different. You know, like, we're just so different. We, we just don't connect. We don't click. Now, I want you to imagine Jesus before the Father. The Father says, son, I want you to go save them fools. And, and Jesus saying, well, Father, we're just, we're so different. I'm holy, they're not. I'm righteous, they're not. I'm glorious, they are terrible. We're just so different. Okay, 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 okay. But it's just going to be so awkward. You know, like, I, I don't, I'm not even going to know what to say. Father, but it's just going to be so awkward. Like, I'm going to be, like, walking on water and, and taking five loaves and two fish and turning them in. And, and they're going to be idiots and be asking me later on, where can we going to get bread from and, and being a bunch of fools, right? Like, it's going to be so awkward. Father, do you see? Your life depends upon this kind of radical cross-cultural love. And if you say you want to be like Jesus, then you're going to be crossing these kinds of borders. You're going to be demonstrating this kind of love at great cost to yourself. Jesus was not afraid of being put to shame for the purposes of loving us. So you don't have to be afraid of being put to shame. You may reach out to someone, and they may not want to have anything to do with your friendship. Guess what? You didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus' friendship. But he loved you back to your senses. He relentlessly and graciously pursued you in love. He was not passive. He wasn't just waiting, hanging back here. He was proactively pursuing you in love. That's what it looks like. When this gospel begins to settle down on you, this is not about adding to the gospel. This is about adding up the gospel. What are the implications for us when we see a God who takes a quantum leap from glory into this broken world in order to heal us, in order to redeem and renew us? He becomes what he was not so that we can become what we were not. The Son of God was not always a human being, but to this day, he sits at the right hand of the Father as a human being pleading our case. No mere man, but a true man. He allowed his existence to be completely altered because of his love for you. If you want to be like Jesus, your life is going to be altered in the pursuit of loving those who are not like you. And this is not that condescending thing where you, you got to help those poor people. No, when you are humbled by the gospel, you say, nobody needs the grace of God more than me, and you believe it, and you move toward people in love, knowing that they don't need some greater remedy than you needed. They need the same gospel, the same Jesus, and when they have that same gospel and that same Jesus, now we can build together. We can persevere in love for one another. We may disagree on things. We can agree to disagree, but we cannot agree to disengage. That is not a Christian response in community. Do you see what God's doing? By the time this story continues to develop, they are baptized. And baptism is this powerful symbol of union with God, union with Christ, and union with one another. And then it, the story of Acts continues on. And you know... This group, when people looked at them, they came up with this distinctive name for them. It was an interesting nickname, and it stuck. They looked at them, and they said, they're kind of Jewish, but they're not Jews. Uh, they have Greeks and Gentiles, but they're not Romans. You know what they are? They're Christians. Because they were made up of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group. By the time we get to the church in Antioch, it represents the world. And Antioch becomes the base of mission to the world because that local church contained the world. They loved the world because the world was represented in their local church. And that is the rest of the story. Because of the cross-cultural conversion that the Holy Spirit worked in the life of Peter. And the other apostles. And guess what? Peter didn't, he didn't get it right for the rest of his life. 
He didn't all of a sudden like, oh, I got it, and I'm going to do this perfectly for the rest of my life. No. How do you know that? Because in Galatians, Peter gets called out by Paul for his racism. And Paul says to him that he is not walking in line with the truth of the gospel because he's withdrawing from the Gentiles. See, he had a relapse. But... He received the rebuke and got back on the horse. And then by the time you get to Peter's letters in the end of the New Testament, he's talking about God's people who are scattered from abroad, brought together. We are one temple. We are built together. We are a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. He's once again thinking straight. I want you to take this into prayer, into, into your dialogue with the Lord. What would RYM look like in a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, four or five years from now, if you all began to take this text and so much of the rest of the Bible seriously, and you began to live into this beautiful picture of cross-cultural love, what would this room look like? Who would be here that is not here now? What would this feel like and sound like? Who would you see meandering around campus? Who would you be running from mountain lions with? That is a beautiful and powerful thing to envision. And I hope in your mind you're thinking something close to the picture of Revelation 7. Every nation, every tribe, every town gathered so that we can anticipate that final picture. May the Lord continue to do this work in your hearts. May he fill you with his spirit, the same spirit that moved Peter toward those people. May he be at work in your life to move you toward whoever those people are in your life so that he may make you more like Jesus and may make the church more beautiful. Amen?